the topic tonight is democracy, meritocracy, or both. Daniel Bell, who is a recidivist at CASBIS. <laughs> this is his second time. Uh, he was here, the first time was? Uh, 12 years ago. 12 years ago, when he was a real young lad, as opposed <laughs> to now. And he is now the chair professor of the Schwartzman Scholar Program at Tsinghua University in Beijing and director of the Berggruen Center of Philosophy and Culture, which I'll come back to in a minute. He was born in Montreal, educated at McGill and Oxford, has taught in Singapore, Hong Kong, and Shanghai. He does speak Chinese. And has held research fellowships at Princeton's University Center for Human Values, um, as well as at other places. He is the author of numerous books, and I'm only going to mention the most recent, which was on sale right around the corner a minute ago at least, um, The China Model, Political Meritocracy and the Limits of Democracy. And is the, he is the co-editor of at least four others, including one with current CASBIS fellow Cheng Yang Li. Cheng Yang, you here? There he is. Um, he is the, the editor of a, a Princeton University press series that aims to translate the most influential and original works of Chinese scholars. He writes widely on Chinese politics and philosophy for the media, including the New York Times, Financial Times, Global Times, Nanfen, you want to pronounce it for Nanfeng me? Nanfeng Zhuo Mo. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I would have said. World Post. <laughs> Project Syndicate and The Guardian's comment is free blog. And he has been interviewed in English, Chinese, and French, which I presumably he responds in those languages as well. His articles and books have been translated in Chinese and 22 other languages. Nicholas Bergrun is the chairman of Bergrun Holdings, a private company which is the direct investment vehicle of the Nicholas Bergrun Charitable Trust. Um, and the group has offices in New York, Berlin, Istanbul, Tel Aviv, and Mumbai. Nicolas was born in Paris, where he studied at, now I presumably speak French, but now I'm going to totally get this terribly badly, at L'Ecole Alsacienne, before attending La Rose in Switzerland. He obtained a Bachelor of Science in Finance and International Business from New York University in 1981. Committed to leaving a legacy of art and architecture, he sits on the boards of Museum Bergruen, a name you might recognize here, which was started by his father, um, or based on his father's collection in Berlin, and the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And he's a member of the International Councils for the Tate Museum, London, and the Museum of Modern Art, New York. He's collaborated on projects with such renowned architects as Richard Meyer, Shing Shigeru Ban, David Ajayi, and now Herzog and Moran. Through the Bergruen Institute, which is an independent nonpartisan think tank, he encourages the study and design of systems of good governance suited to the 21st century. The Institute supports World Post, which I do recommend you all look up. It's a web-based news uh, show, um, which is the international arm of the Huffington Post, which it is co-sponsored with. Its editor, Nathan Gardels, and Nicholas are the co-authors of the book Intelligent Governance for the 21st Century, which a book I strongly recommend, and are hard at work on a second book. In both, they draw on the experiences of the Bergruen Institute and its three programs devoted to improving government in different parts of the world, 21st Century Council, the Council for the Future of Europe, and the Think Long Committee for California, which has had all kinds of co positive consequences for the state. The newest endeavor of the Institute is the Bergruen Center for Philosophy and Culture, which emerged in this very room. Well, it probably started before this room, but mm -hmm. it really got its momentum going it's in this very room. Right. It's all me, <laughs> right. Um, out of where there was an initial brainstorming session to figure out what, how to take this idea forward. I'm happy to announce that the first Bear Gruen Fellows are part of this year's CASBIS class. And I really like them to stand, because this is in part about you all. Um, David, Chen Ying, there they are. <laughs> not Glenn. <laughs> Glenn, you're not a, you're not a Bear Gruen Fellow. <laughs> 
We'll take We're him. We're very proud of having we'll Glenn, but he's him. not a Brooke Rowan fellow. <laughs> And you'll see, you can see probably a little of the difference between you know, Glenn Taiwan and the Bear Grun fellows, <laughs> who are largely Asian and South Asian, know. East Asian, as opposed to American or African. Um, so uh, that conversation in which uh, Daniel, Nicholas, and a whole bunch of us engaged um, was a really exciting moment and allowed the center to not only did they create the Bergrun uh, Center for Philosophy and Culture, which is really a way to begin to think about East-West dialogues and how to encourage them around a whole host of themes, but it also was a really important moment for the center because it allowed us to think about doing things differently and absorbing into our regular classes a whole group of people which immediately internationalized us even more than we had been all of whom are superb scholars, more than met our standards, our normal very high standards, and allowed us to get Daniel back, who we can tease regularly <laughs> at lunch, and to bring Nicholas here from time to time. So that's enough of me in the introduction. What I want to do now is turn to Daniel, who will speak for about 20 minutes. Nicholas will then speak. He says he's only going to speak for two minutes, but hopefully he'll speak for longer than that. The two of them will then engage in a conversation that I'll try to help along if they're having trouble. And then at the last 15 minutes, we'll open it up. Hi, Jeff. We'll open it up um, to the audience for questions. Okay? So, Daniel. So, um, well, thank you so much. It's a genuine a honor moment. to be here. And um, I must confess, <coughs> um, well, thank you also, Nicholas and, and Margaret. But maybe I should begin with a confession, um, which is that, to be frank, if I had s heard what I'm about to say when I was a fellow here 12 years ago, I would have been appalled, you know, and, I, and it, I would have been deeply disturbed by this person who's about to say what I'm about to say. Um, and so I guess we want to ask, you know, well, what happened to me? Or, you know, why did I change? Why am I a different person? And the truth is quite simple, that I fell in love. And um, I fell in love with, with a country, not with a person. Um, so my wife isn't too jealous. You know, that country is China. And I've spent the past 12 years in China. And um, of course, the, the, it's not, uh, you know, that love does shape what I read, you know, what I write, what I research, what I care about. But it's not blind love, right? I mean, just like somebody that you particularly care about in the family, I have a very critical approach when things go wrong. So, it's still a very much of a critical view. Um, though uh, I must confess that sometimes, you know, just like if your lover is attacked un unfairly, I do react in more emotional and, and, and ways than I, than I ought to. So we developed, a, and it, often this happens in the US, so uh, we developed a system whereby Margaret would kick me if I sound too emotional. So, please, so if she does that today, <laughs> Don't, don't be surprised. Um, the, basically, she's telling me to be, become more rational. So from now on, uh, let me try to be more you know, rational and to uh, say something about this topic, which is how best can we reconcile democracy and meritocracy? Now, I'm going to begin with two assumptions that I don't think are very controversial, right? The first is that democracy is a good thing, that nobody wants to be ruled by somebody who has total power over us. You know, we want to have some say over the way that we're ruled. I mean, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. So I'm not going to go into much more detail. The other assumption, though, is that political meritocracy is a good thing. And what do I mean by that? I just mean that the political system is aimed to select and promote leaders with superior ability and virtue. Now, I don't think that's so strange either, right? I mean, if I'm in a political community and my political leader is totally incompetent, you know, misunderstands basic facts, uh, especially if it's a big community and their policies could make a difference in the world, that's a problem, right? I mean, nobody, no rational person wants to be ruled by a Don, uh, Donald Trump. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, that, wasn't, I, I, that came out, it wasn't fun. No rational person wants to be ruled by somebody who is, you know, totally incompetent. And Anyway, the second point, though, is that we also want to be ruled by somebody who is virtuous just in the very minimal sense, that are at least partly motivated by the desire to serve 
the community, not just serve their own interests or their family members, right? Nobody, no rational person wants to be ruled by a corrupt person who misuses public funds for their own private needs, right? I mean, is, that's not very controversial, right? So the big question is, how then can we reconcile these interests we have in democracy and meritocracy? So in my book, I discuss three approaches. And the first approach um, is one that is perhaps the most obvious. But let me just say a little bit first about what motivates this, this, this not just this book, but kind of my current view. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, or may, sorry, maybe four years ago, I was always interested in Chinese philosophy, but then I noticed, oh my God, something is interesting is happening in China. Um, I, I read about Chinese imperial history where for like basically 1,300 years until the early 20th century, political leaders were selected. I mean, I call them political leaders because they really exercise political power. First by examinations and then by performance evaluations at lower levels of government. And then I began to notice that this same system is being reestablished, at least in form, over the past three decades in China. So there's been this reestablishment of this traditional political system in China. So people say there's been no political reform in China. Well, that's only if we use this view that the only thing that counts as political reform is one person, one vote. But if you just set aside that assumption, then there's been lots of political reform. And it's really very similar, at least in form, to the kind of political system that we had in imperial China. I thought, wow, this is fascinating. So I wrote a couple of comments and op-eds in the Financial Times and New York Times, and I was massacred. People saying, this guy is defending authoritarianism. It's terrible. He's gone native. He's drank the Kool-Aid. And <laughs> so what I did, I like, fine, OK. I'm going to take a few years off, just do lots of research on this, and write a book that's meant to be balanced and systematic and so on. And that's why I wrote the book. OK. Now, what is the methodology, though? The, well, look. I'm not a defend, look, I'm in love with the ideal, not so much with the political reality. I'm defending this ideal of a model, which I then use to critically evaluate the reality. So my view is very, very, it's still critical, actually. In fact, I'm having trouble uh, publishing my book in Chinese, you know, which suggests that at least the censors in China know what's going on. Um, so, so the question is then, so let me just describe a bit about this ideal, and then I'll apply it a bit to the reality, right? And I can do all this in, in, uh, in hopefully in, in 15 minutes. So what are the ways of reconciling democracy and meritocracy? Well, the first way is the most straightforward, in the West anyway. Why not just leave it to the voters to decide, you know, what kind of leaders they want, right? If they, if they, if they want rational, if they want like a uh, superior ability and virtue, then let the voters decide. The problem with that assumption is that, and it's a pretty systematically uh, established uh, finding in social science, that voters are not very rational. You know, in China, people always say, oh, you know, well, we don't have high level of education or sujur, like quality. So when we get to the like, developed stage, then we can become like the West. But it turns out that in the West, many of the s findings in social science establish that voters often systematically misunderstand their own interests. You know, there's a book published by Princeton called The Myth of the Rational Voter. It's written by an economist, and he shows that typically Americans misunderstand their economic interests, and he argues for economic tests of competence that you would have to pass before you have the right to vote. Of course, that's a non-starter, right? Um, but even if the voters are rational, it doesn't mean that they're moral. If when you vote, it's not like going to a movie, right? When you vote, you're choosing somebody who has power who doesn't just affect what you do, it affects what others do. So you want to have an other guarding motive, at least partly when you vote. But many voters are selfish. They vote strictly in accordance with their economic interests. And the news is even worse than that. It tends to be the most rational voters are the, are the wealthy ones. So in the American system, look, I'm Canadian. I, it's easy for me to criticize the US, so please apologize for that. Um, you know, it's the, it's the wealthy voters who vote in accordance with their private, with their private interests. Now, that's wrong too, right? So we want voters who are knowledgeable about their interests and are other regarding. But even that is a problem because if you have voters who are ra rational about their interests and they know about the interests of their voting community, what about non-voters who are affected by the policies of the government, like future generations? They're affected by the policies of the government, but nobody represents their interests in a democratic system. 
So what's going to happen if there's a conflict between the interests of voters and non-voters? Well, typically, the interests of voters would have priority. This matters on issues like climate change, right? Okay, so how do we deal with that? Well, in the 19th century, you had great thinkers like John Stuart Mill, the British you know, liberal, said he recognizes that, of course, not everybody has equal capacity to be rational and moral when they participate in <coughs> politics. So let's give extra votes to, um, he said, educated people, or at least, or those engaged in professions that are more other regarding, maybe like medicine or something. But that's not going to work either, right? Because once you have one person, one vote, nobody's one is, is going to say, yeah, I'm not very rational. I'll defer to those who are more rational. You know, that's going to be engendered tremendous amount of resentment. So once you have one person, one vote, it's very hard to change, no matter what the case is in favor of changing. So what are other ways then of reconciling um, democracy and meritocracy? Well, one way um, is thinking about at the central level of government, right? And this is Friedrich Hayek, you know, the great economist and also political philosopher. He was a strong liberal, not so much a Democrat. And he said, well, I worry too about having all this, you know, everything leaving it up to the people. He says, let's have one house of government where the leaders are chosen by one person, one vote and another house of government where they're chosen on the basis of their competence and performance, and that's a more meritocratic house. These people would have 15-year terms. They wouldn't be subject to uh, recall by the people. The problem with that is that how likely is that going to work? Think of in Canada, the Senate, or the, U or the UK, the House of Lords. The House of Lords works very well. It's a much more deliberative institution than the House of Commons, you know, but the it has not so great legitimacy. All political parties are against it because they think it's not democratic. Anytime you have a central government where one house is democratic and one house is meritocratic, the democratic house is likely to have power and marginalize the meritocratic house. So that's a kind of non-starter. Well, what about in China or other East Asian countries where there's political surveys consistently show much stronger support for political meritocracy? How's that going to work? Well, maybe there it's more hopeful. Sun Yat-sen, you know, the great founding father who's regarded as founding father of both Taiwan and mainland China, he said, well, why don't we have elections, fine, and then we have examinations. So only if you pass examinations can you become a political leader. Now, that's not such a, like, think, like this could be simple examinations, like a driving test, right? Um, <laughs> but even that is a total non-starter, because just imagine if you have like one person gets elected with 80% of the vote and fails this examinations, and you have another person, 20%, who passes, and then this person becomes a leader, you know, she would totally lack, or he would totally lack legitimacy, right? So it's a non-starter. And even in China, to be frank, like you have many of my friends, you know, Jiang Qing, you know, Bai Tongdong, and so on. They advocated bicameral legislature for China, one democratic house, one meritocratic house. And I was also very fond of this view over the past, like, you know, uh, many years ago. But today in China, too, I think if you establish that, first of all, it's a non starter it's not going to happen. It's not politically realistic. But if it does happen, it would be impossible to consolidate the power of the meritocratic house, because even in China, I think the democratic house would gradually have more power. So what's another way of recons... How many more minutes do I have? Five minutes. Finally, with, and then I'll end with some criticisms. What's another way of reconciling democracy and meritocracy? Well, there's a very good case for democracy at the local level, right? I mean, Western political theorists have said this all the time, right? Aristotle, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you know, Montesquieu, they all said democracy works best at the local level. We know what the issues are. Whether you build a road here, a road there, it's, very, it's not so complicated. It doesn't require lots of experience in government, you know? Um, and if you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world, you know? At the central level, it's a big problem if you make a mistake. Do we invade Iraq or not? You know, it's a big problem. So, so, so at the local level, it's, there's a strong case for democracy. Um, and at the central level, we want leaders who have lots of experience, lots of grooming, who are sensitive to long-term interests of the political community. That seems like a good model at the vertical model. Democracy at the local level, meritocracy at the top, and in between in a big country like China, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Lots of room for experimentation. This is more or less the model that has inspired political reform over the past 30 years in China. This is where I can express my love. I think it's a beautiful model. But there's a huge gap between the ideal and the reality. And what are the two major problems? The first 
is that the meritocratic part, we want leaders who have ability at the central level. Let's say at the city level and above. Remember in China, cities are huge, right? 10 million and over. I don't think there's a big problem there in terms of ability. I've met leaders at the city level and above. Intellectual ability, no problem. Like nobody like Rob Ford in Toronto would get through the system you know, in, in, in China. Forget about it. But the problem comes with virtue. So many of them are corrupt. And that undermines the legitimacy of the whole system. In a democracy, they get their legitimacy by virtue of being chosen by the people. In China, that's not a source of legitimacy, obviously. So where do they get their legitimacy? Well, nationalism, you know, performance legitimacy, if they do a good job. Even meritocracy, if they're viewed as having superior merit, then they get more legitimacy. But the problem is that if they're corrupt, how can they have superior virtue? It undermines the legitimacy of the whole system. That's why now, the past two years, has been the most systematic and longest anti-corruption campaign in Chinese history. They know what has gone wrong in previous dynasties. Even in the 20th century, why did the communists win, not the KMT? One important reason is the communists were viewed as less corrupt. They know that, com that corruption can kill the whole system. If they don't resolve that, forget about it, right? That's what's going on in China. We want, I think, to understand the anti-corruption campaign, you really have to understand. The good news is that I think many other countries are corrupt, like India, you know, Indonesia, I mean, uh, is probably just as corrupt as China, right? Maybe Don Emerson can elaborate. But in a democracy, if they're corrupt, it's not a fatal blow to the system. You just vote the government out of power. In China, you don't have that option. If the government is corrupt, the only way out is revolution, right? So they know what's going on. If corruption isn't solved, forget about it. It's the end of the political system, okay? So that's one thing. The other thing, um, well, the other thing is really democratic accountability. So first, the system is not sufficiently meritocratic, but the system is not sufficiently democratic. We all know what's going on. The, so many restrictions on civil and political liberties, you know, and it's frustrating for, like, for a professor like, you know, in China, you know, teaches political theory, we often encounter constraints, right? But anyway, so the question is, how can you have democratic accountability without electoral democracy at the top? Because the virtues of the system is that the leaders, they have this decades-long grooming, they can have a long-term outlook, they can carry out experimentation at lower levels, um, and then, uh, and, 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 and let's see what experiments work, and that takes a long time, many years. You can and there's a decider at the top. Not too many veto points you know, in the whole process. We want to keep that. How can you have more democracy while keeping that? Lots of things. More democracy at local levels, more elections you know, r uh, uh, throughout the political system, more elections within the political, within the Communist Party, which is 88 million people, it's the world's biggest organization. Um, more deliberation, more consultation, all that is great. How can you do that? At some point though, to be frank, I do think there's going to be more and more demand for political participation. How can you, how can you satisfy that demand while preserving the virtues of the system? Well, in my book I propose something quite controversial, and I don't think now the crisis is so serious that it needs to be implemented in the near future. Maybe in 10 years or 20 years, there might be a need for some sort of like referendum that'll provide democratic legitimacy to the system. Just ask the people, do you endorse this model of democracy at the bottom, experimentation in the middle, meritocracy at the top, with much more political openness, short of one person, one vote to choose top leaders? If they say yes, 80% Chinese say yes, that would be great, and the rest of the world would appreciate China and love it as much as I do. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I would say the reason why I'm here and the reason why probably I started this um, uh, adventure of creating a uh, capacity through the think tank of looking at political systems and comparing them and trying to come up with ideas including reforms is really sort of the dilemma that um, Daniel put on the table. Um, and uh, you know, we, we had a discussion over the weekend here um, at the center uh, was a wonderful group of people from China, from Europe, and from the US. Very different political cultures, very, politi very different uh, philosophical um, uh, traditions. And, um, and we, frankly, we didn't come up with a good solution. I'm not sure we ever will. And the dilemma is really what um, I think Daniel uh, indirectly uh, put on the table. 
the dilemma is on one side, you want government that is really for the people in general, that's really a service organization, that's there to uh, serve the long term, uh, serve the most people possible, not leave people out, and is competent. Uh, how do you put this government in place? How do you make sure that they do their job? And how can you make changes? Um, so the, the, let's say the China model is, uh, in theory, uh, you have um, one, one body, the government, that has the power and also the responsibility to deliver. And uh, it's run, in essence, a little bit like a corporation. In that sense, it's a competitive environment within the organization. In this case, the party controls uh, the state. So you have a lot of competition within the party. You have a lot of competition for appointments uh, of power, meaning at the state level. And you have it all under one roof. Uh, so you have a lot of competition within it. And therefore, it points out at the end of the day, uh, very often, uh, to uh, the more competent, the more accomplished people rise to the top. Obviously, there are things like relationships, which is where corruption can come in. Uh, there is uh, charisma even within organizations. Everybody knows that. But at the end of the day, in theory, the very best people rise to the top. So it sounds good. Uh, and in theory, it's very good. Uh, the only question is, what happens if um, this, uh, you know, the, the organization itself, for self-preservation purposes, uh, really, even if it not that competent, doesn't renew itself. Uh, and in the case of uh, those systems, it's very hard since there's no recall uh, mechanism. There's no uh, possibility to change um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the power. And that's really the failing of in, you know, the Chinese uh, system, where in theory, you have meritocratic competition uh, for delivery but you don't really have a recall system. Well, in the West, we have uh, a system where um, uh, we compete uh, to uh, govern. Uh, and that competition is really, at the end of the day, um, uh, a popularity contest. And um, this popularity contest is based on uh, communications, on results, on lots of different things and you have winners and losers. So the nice thing is it's very open. Uh, you can change the government, uh, change the people whenever you'd like. On the other hand, uh, you don't, as Daniel uh, mentioned, you don't necessarily get the most competent people to run things. You get potentially the most popular people to run things. And you have a system where you have winners and losers. And very often the people who uh, end up with power are the winners, the losers, don't want the winners to ultimately be successful. So you have internal competition, uh, even if uh, a party has won. So you have gridlock. So in terms of the capacity to govern and to get results, democracies will be dynamic, but will very often block the ability of government to actually get results done. So you see it, I come from Europe, you see it in Europe, We've had many crises in Europe over the last few years, economic crisis, then you had Putin, now you have the migrant crisis. Europe is totally paralyzed because of the system is unable to really be effective in terms of decision making. So you have a situation where decision making is very, very weak. And then you go to the Chinese model, they have the ability to get things done. The question is, will they get things done correctly or not? And if they don't do something that's correct, there's no way of recalling it you'll know maybe a generation later, and you have to deal with it. So the dilemma is, I think, profound. Because on one side, you want merit. You want the best people. That's the Chinese system. On the other side, you want to respect the, the you know, individual citizens. Um, you want their will um, uh, to be represented, and you want a recall capacity. And interestingly enough, we haven't found a hybrid system. What Daniel talked about from time to time was a hybrid system where you have two houses, a meritocratic house and an elected house. And in theory, they co-govern. It really hasn't worked in, hasn't existed in a proper, play, in a proper way in practice. Could it? Maybe. 
Uh, could you have something where you have people who are elected, once they're in government, they're supposed to take their partisan hat off and really run you know, things for everyone? That's very nice in theory. It doesn't happen in practice. Could you have something like China, uh, where you could have every few years a vote that could, or recall mechanism, so you can vote the government out uh, or the party out in case um, you know, people are really fed up, maybe. Uh, so the question is, are there, you know, can, with some imagination, can we come up with something that combines sort of the best of the two systems? Um, and this is really part of our efforts at the Institute. We're working on it. We need all the help we can get because to combine sort of very different mentalities, both valid to some extent, uh, frankly, has been very difficult. But that's where we are in terms of our thinking and the dis discussions we have internally. Maybe, Margaret, you can provoke Daniel and I, and we can, um, and you as uh, audience should really be participants. Maybe you have um, um, remarks, questions, ideas. Thank you. Here. You sit here. Maybe you're so, on right Nicholas, you right. promised me you were going to um, attack, take, say something very opposite to what Daniel said, and I didn't hear that in what you just said. It was more of a balancing act and trying to get both of them together. But Daniel was very reasonable. So, uh, <laughs> That's true. Which is unusual. Thank you. <laughs> um, the. Um, I mean, the Chinese system, in theory, uh, you know, is the best system because you you have, and, and from a Western standpoint, it make it, it's intuitively wrong uh, because you don't have the power really in the hands of the people. But if you really think of the what's behind the Chinese system, uh, government is not power, it's service. And so if you have an organization that's there to make sure the place functions, meaning a state or country functions, and you then have uh, an organization that is highly competitive within the organization, highly trained, and with the sole objective to serving um, the people, run the place, um, it makes a lot of sense. And, um, and, and in theory, it's even designed that way. You have different branches of government. You have uh, you know, different ministries. But you have, from the very beginning, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was the case in China, in Taiwan, Singapore, a number of different places. Uh, you have sort of an independent organization or independent branch that is like a human resource department that is sort of the, the, the personnel department that only cares, are the people good, who is good, what are they doing, should they be promoted, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, are they corrupt? Uh, so the whole idea of government, not as power, but government as a service, is really a, 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 a wonderful idea. The challenge is at times very good, at times not so good. The question then is also are minorities protected or not. Um, I think, you know, and Daniel will probably correct me, but, you know, in China there is probably the sense if you can do good for the nation in general, if you sacrifice a minority, that's fine because it's good for the, for the whole. We have a very different attitude in the West where we say, listen, uh, you know, we, we're almost willing to sacrifice the majority to protect the minority. Uh, is that better? I think it's better from a human standpoint, but is it better for the progress of a country long term? So you have really very different um, cultures. I respect the, the Chinese culture because of the intent. The real question is, can you, um, uh, if the government, and this is a bad emperor issue, if the, uh, if the, uh, the party uh, is misusing its power, and government is no longer serving the people, what can you do about it? Um, we in the West have this recall mechanism. 
Um, but let's not forget in the West, uh, the, you have the sort of tyranny of the majority and you have had democratically elected bad people. Hitler was democratically ele elected. So you, it's not a guarantee, but we obviously have um, give everybody a voice. Uh, we have a recall mechanism. Um, our capacity to govern is frankly weaker, and therefore civil society is much more important. So that's the other point that I think maybe we didn't cover, is that the US, as an example, has a huge civil society. This is, I think, the best example. We're in California, and we, I think, at the epicenter of uh, civil society, sort of Silicon Valley, where Silicon, I mean, where civil society can function, create, do things uh, very far away from Washington or even Sacramento. And uh, that's the, the value of, I think, um, uh, having a very dynamic and, and, uh, and a big civil society. Europe, less so. And then a place like China, much less so. So you're much more dependent on the government. So in China, government has to be really good. In America, government has to be good, but not great, because civil society is, is, is so powerful. On the other hand, in the US, this may, may not be, I mean, may, may not, people may not appreciate it, but you have, because government will only go so far, civil society is very independent, you have an enormous amount of inequality. Um, in Europe, less so, because again, government is very involved. Uh, in a place like China, uh, inequality exists by definition. Uh, uh, the question is, in theory, it's a communist country, uh, the, not in practice, can, will the government help those who need to be helped? It's a big question mark. I'm not sure. Daniel, you want to respond to that at all? Well, I, I mean, I agree. Just one little point. Um, I mean, there's two, you know, two things. Is, you know, the imp we should, it's worth recalling that you know, China has learned from its experience with totally unaccountable dictatorial power, right? That's what you had under Mao. You had a pretty much a disaster once he took power, right? But now there's collective leadership at the top with term and age limits, so it's a form of accountability. I agree if it, it's always possible that, for example, Xi Jinping would say, I'm not, I'm going to change the rules. That would be a disaster, you know? But it's not, it's still, China does learn from its mistakes to a certain extent, you know, sort of if I sound too pro-China. And the other thing about, so society, I'm I mean... too far away from you to kick you, so... <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about civil society, I mean, China, you know, okay, well, ha let's just re stick to, like, um, entrepreneurial activity in China. I mean, maybe, yeah, you know more about this than I do, but my impression that it's, is pretty much booming now. You know, I even met just yes, uh, last week here some Chinese venture capitalists who were, who were saying that now, you know, Xiaomi, the, like the phone company in China, they manufacture iPhone style type phones much cheaper. Now the Americans want to learn from what China is doing. So I, I'm not sure that, you know, society is kind of, you know, very dormant. When I think of civil society, I don't really think about Silicon Valley. Okay. I have to say, <laughs> it's not what first comes to my mind. Um, what really first comes to my mind is the capacity to protest, to debate, to try to figure out what the collective good means, to write um, stories and put them in the press or over the internet and not get censored. That that is part of what civil society is. And that seems to me a real problem in China. It's not that it doesn't exist, but it tends to be repressed and it's much more open here, which yeah. has... Well, I, I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> uh, should I... You want to? So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just mean, I've, I totally agree. But still, you know, even, uh, you know, there's a lot going on, you know, in the Weixin, you know, the, um, the equivalent of WeChat, you know, lots of collective protests, you know, I mean, even teaching in political theory, I can say what I want in class, but when I publish in Chinese, that's when the censors kick in. So I'm, it's just a different ballgame than North Korea, which is totally totality. It wasn't something I was thinking about comparing okay. with, okay. <laughs> <laughs> frankly. But I agree with you, so yeah. I, I don't mean to say otherwise. Yeah. So I have one more question to throw at you, and then let's open it to the audience, which is I hear in what both of you are saying, and I was lucky to be part of the discussions over the weekend, that there is, you believe that China 
one of the great things about China, as opposed to the US or Europe, is that it is more capable of serving the people as a whole. I keep coming back to who's defining that. And how do you challenge that? How do you think about that? Um, you know, I, I'm very nervous about presuming that some meritocratic individual has a very good conception of what the public, the, serving the society as a whole means. So I, I'd love you two to address that. Do you want to go first? I mean, so, in, 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 until recently in China, there was a consensus that serving the people meant poverty reduction, and the best means to, for that is economic growth. There wasn't, of course, you yeah, always had a few people on the side, but generally speaking, intellectuals, reformers, you know, farmers, workers, that was pretty much a consensus. But now it's breaking down because there's so many other problems in China. You know, environmental disasters, huge gap between rich and poor. So I totally agree with you that we need much more you know, civil society, okay, no scare quotes, civil society and, and just people to organize and make their views known and argue about what, it, what the common good means. I, I, political you weren't supposed to do that. You were supposed to tell me why. <laughs> okay. <laughs> China has a mechanism for, anyway, okay. So, yeah, good. well, that's, that's my. Nicholas? Oh. Well, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a very good question. How do you define um, the common good? Um, but I think part of it is the starting point. If the starting point is government is there to serve and for the common good, um, that's a very important element. And if, if, if you have a monopoly of power, you know you're only going to survive if at the end of the day you make people happy. You, it, it, sounds, the, it sounds like because you have a monopoly of power, Nobody can put you out. But the intrusive, if you don't do a good job, you are out. So at the end of the day, you're, you're, the pressure is actually extremely high to perform. And uh, performance in, in this sense is really sort of making the people happy in general. So the question then is, what, may, what is meant to make people happy? And frankly, I think, again, the Chinese way, and forgive I mean, I could be wrong, so please uh, correct me. A Chinese way is very, very practical. Uh, you know, what, is, what will make, what will function for people? It's to have um, physical means, you know, uh, uh, food, transportation, housing, access to information. Um, they're interested in community. They're interested in a lot of things that are very basic sort of human needs. Um, and that's really considered, let's say, a service. Um, so if you fulfill services, that's really the, the main role of government. And I think that in the West and in some non-Western um, um, cultures, uh, government also has a moral role. In some cases, it was mixed up with religion. Reli you know, religion and, and, and government were, were one. That generally, correct me if I'm wrong, is not the case in the East. So again, very different mentality. So you're right. What are these standards and who defines them? And um, if you have no independent way of judging it, I think it's very dangerous. But in truth, it depends what the starting point is. And if the starting point is uh, service as opposed to power, then I think uh, you already have a very different kind of starting point. And um, if you look at Western thinking, if you look at Machiavelli or so, um, Service is part of it. Power is, I would say, almost equally important. And, um, and if, you, if you think about, um, uh, again, again, I could be misreading. Eastern traditions, they're more about service, much less about power. Why don't I open it up to questions? And we have about 15 minutes, and there are a lot of people. No, no, uh, I <laughs> Jeff, and then Carol, and then I'll go over here, Don. Just like oh, and I just need to tell you, we're taping this, and since you're not mic'd up, I'm going to repeat some variant of the question okay. so that uh, it'll be on the tape. Well, I want to challenge some, some of the assumptions. I, I think the, the principal assumption is that, you know, democracy doesn't work that well. We pick poor leaders and we end up being inefficient. And if you look at the course of U.S. history, you know, we pick some bad presidents, but by and large, we pick very good presidents. 
And overall, I think we're pretty happy with the performance of government. Maybe not in the last little bit. <laughs> but, but, you know, that is a short period of time and a very long uh, process. And so I think we need to take a step back and say, you know, is this a system that can't work or is this a system that needs to be tweaked? Um, it, it, it seems to me we do have a meritocracy baked into the system, whether it's the parties sort of winnowing the field and narrowing the field of candidates, whether it's the media elites narrowing the terms of debate as we get closer to elections, whether it's the um, corporate and economic elites who are funneling money to help um, give advantages to um, particular candidates in the process that we have. I think we have a lot of meritocracy baked into the system. The, the real issue is what you started out with, which is that voters, some voters are going to be either irrational um, or they will be, um, um, you know, focused on their own rational self-interest to the exclusion of others, um, or they'll be ill-informed. But overall, when, when you take a whole society, they tend to vote pretty well. And maybe the issue is not so much that we have too much democracy, so we don't have enough. If you had 100% of people voting, I think we'd have pretty good results, time and time again. The problem is we get sliced and diced, and you know, certain people turn out to vote and are driven out to vote and they can skew the results. Jeff, Hitler, I'm going to have to stop okay, you in a second. <laughs> one piece. Hitler um, wasn't elected by the majority of Germans. He was elected by the majority of Germans who voted. You know, if you had 100% voting, um, Hitler would not have been the, the, the leader of Germany. And I think that's also true of George W. Bush and other people who may not be popular in the room. I'm going to, okay, so the, the issue really is questioning the underlying assumptions I'm going to take two other questions and then let you address them so we can get more voices in here. So Carol and Don, and then I'll open it up again. Okay, so it seems to me that Carol, you might. This was. You should have introduced yourself, oh. Jeff. Oh, I, I'm, I'm Jeff Fleischer. I'm a member of the CASBIS board, and I came back recently from being ambassador in Australia. A country where they seem to hold their they have prime minister <laughs> accountable. <laughs> 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 Carol. <laughs> I'm Carol Heimer. I'm part of this year's CASBIS class. I'm a sociologist from Northwestern. Um, it seems to me that you're in talking of actually about two, three kinds of key traits, but you're analyzing them as if there's only two. So you're talking about democracy on the one hand and competence on the other, and then you keep slipping in other regarding this. But you haven't actually fully analyzed other regarding this, and sometimes it seems like you think, well, it's really part of meritocracy, and sometimes it seems like you think, well, you know, it's like everybody's got some other regarding this. And it seems to me that we'd be far better off if you would actually do a careful analysis of what other regarding this is and how it gets built into political systems and where there's more and where there's less other regarding this and how we institutionalize that. Thank you. Don, introduce yeah, Don yourself. Yeah, Stanford University. Following up on that comment, I must say that Cass Sunstein's notion of nudging is something that you probably already looked at. But that would be an answer to your point about other regarding this. It seems to me that there's a risk here and an opportunity. The most obvious risk to me is that the closer you tie your model, not the China model, but the Daniel Bell model to China, the risk rises, especially now when arguably from an objective standpoint, if one can have an objective standpoint, if we look at the economic elites in China and how they are handling the plateauing and beginning of decline in the growth rate that they counted on so strongly for performance legitimacy, arguably there's a fair amount of incompetence dumping billions of dollars onto the market with little or no result. And so therefore your moral argument, your normative argument is in a sense made prisoner of the empirics of the Chinese case. Now it does seem to me that if we look at the other risk, the intellectual risk, there are two key elements in your argument, it seems to me. One is virtue and one is merit. Insofar as you essentialize both, and forgive me, I'm not saying you do, I'm saying this is a risk that I'm sure you're aware of. In the case of virtue, 
I might have been virtuous, but I am no longer virtuous because I am responding to the opportunities for corruption that I now have because Daniel Bell has propelled me upward after I passed the exam. So the contingency, the, the role of contingency as opposed to the idealized version of, uh, of virtue or, or merit seems to me really quite important. You mentioned Donald Trump, and I can't resist. Yesterday, Donald Trump, speaking to a wildly cheering crowd, uh, and frankly, the comment about American democracy today, I would say American democracy today is dysfunctional, which is one reason I'm attracted to at least the moral part of your argument. Don, I'm going to have to speed you up, too, because okay, we're sir, getting sir, very sir, long sir, comments sir, from sir, everybody. Donald Trump says, we are sick and tired of being ruled by incompetent people. Now, his notion of, of competence is very different from yours, right? <laughs> and I just, one more thing, which is that there are scholars, as you know, that are working on this problem from angles that have nothing to do with China. We have a scholar at Stanford, Nico Ravania, who is trying to work out a way, believe it or not, of discouraging people who lack virtue from taking the civil service exam for fear that they might pass. <laughs> they're, they're, they're fascinating experiments underway that take us away from the risks of the China model as opposed to a better model. I can't summarize any of that. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll let, I'll let you try to respond to it, and then I'm going to take, I'm, we're going to go on a little longer than our normal 6.30, because there's clearly a lot of desire to talk, and I think we should just recognize that. But do keep your comments a little shorter. <laughs> a, it wasn't, it was everybody. Well, why don't you respond first? Oh, you stop. <laughs> <laughs> problems with the China model, problems with the underlying assumptions, other regarding this. I, I mean, on, on, on voting, making it compulsory, as you mentioned, Australia has compulsory voting, but look what happened. You know, they, they changed their views on climate change. So the basic problem of this lack of long-term perspective, I don't think that could be solved through uh, compulsory They're back on voting. the old idea now. Pardon me? They just changed prime minister last night, two nights ago. Okay, so maybe they'll change. <laughs> but look, Obama and Xi Jinping signed an accord on climate change in the year, two th uh, going up to the year 2030. Who, who are you going to bet on? Who's going to stick to the accord, you know? Well, for me, I'd bet on China. But anyway, if the Republicans win, forget about the Obama accord. You know, in China, you don't have that problem. So look, I'm, I'm not saying every system has advantages and disadvantages, but at least long-term perspective, we, I think it's hard to deny that China has that advantage, right? Um, whether regarding this, I agree, it's very important to study empirically, and I hope to study, I and mean, that's why I'm here, partly, is, is to, to learn from much of the uh, social science on these issues. So I, I'm not, I agree, I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I don't mean to deny uh, that I need to learn a lot more. And, and, and Don, Don, I mean, look, there's so much, every time there's a crisis in China, you know, like you, ever since 1989, they predict like the collapse of the system, it shows that it's not working, you know, happened in Boshi Lai, now the stock market, you know, we can call it crash or correction, I think correction. You know, I don't think it means that the whole system isn't rewarding competent people, it means that people make mistakes no matter how competent they are, but the real question is do they learn from their mistakes and correct it? I think I have a bit more faith in the Chinese system in this respect, you know. Nicholas, do you have anything you want to add to that? Well, I, I think the only, I'll go to the ambas ambassador's comment, which I think is correct. I mean, the, the U.S. has done a good job. I mean, this, there's a reason why this country is still number one. Um, and uh, so U.S. has done a good job. Um, so democracy has worked for the U.S. The question is, will it continue to work as well in the future? And um, you, for the first time, have some competition, real competition, from other parts of the world, other cultures, other political systems, in this case, China. Um, and is the U.S. system sort of self-correcting? And um, is it going to be as good to serve the U.S. and, frankly, the world as it was in the past? And the, the, the question we are asking ourselves is, can, is there something to do to improve the U.S. system? And, um, and it's interesting. I think citizens in the U.S., right and left, don't like their government. So it, it's a symptom of something. Um, and uh, maybe 50 or 100 years ago, and frankly, I, sh I don't know. Uh, I'm sure somebody here does know. Uh, maybe the respect for government was higher. Um, and... Um, uh, so the question is, you know, is that 
going to be normal going forward, or do we need to make some changes so that people respect the government a bit more? And what will change things so that government is, has, has more respect? And if it has more respect, it will probably be able to do much more. And the, the issue in the US especially is that you have this winner-loser. One side is in power, the other side is not. And the side that's not in power is incredibly resentful in, uh, of the other side. So you have gridlock. That's why I go back to the fact civil society in a large sense, but I really mean the, in this sense the, the economic civil society, is so dynamic in the US that government doesn't play such a huge role. But from time to time government does great things, and from time to time government does terrible things. Um, and the question is, can you sort of calm that down? Can you make it, uh, uh, can you get, going back to the, the question of merit and competence, can you get capable people, the best people in government as opposed to the most popular people, and would that make a difference? And can I just add one, well, now let's open it, sorry. Okay, uh, uh, what I should do is take questions from people who probably won't be at dinner tonight because you can ask them then. So good, I got, I got two hands down. Um, you were next and then Ben Long and then, sorry, I don't know your name. Chander. And I think we may have to stop there. Did I leave somebody out who's desperate to ask a question? Okay. <laughs> okay, you four ask your questions. Try to keep them, or you make your comments, and try to keep them brief, um, and then we'll get a response, and we'll thank you. Okay, Introduce so yourself. I'm Andrew Shigella, I'm a Catalyst Fellow. Um, I, thank you, it was interesting and really great. I'm curious, though, about the notion of meritocracy. It sounded like you set it up such that you could have somebody who passed all the exams and was really, really good and full of merit, but the worry would always be that they're not virtuous. And I guess I wonder why you couldn't build not a multiple choice exam exactly, but some sort of test for virtue into a long process of cultivating your, I mean, look at Plato's Republic or look at Sparta for a real world example. I mean, there was this long process of watching people, seeing them develop kind of practical wisdom and then selecting them as leaders. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Sparta. <laughs> <laughs> But develop at some kind of way of um, evaluating virtue other than just through a simple exam. Uh, I think Ben Wong. Will, uh, will you introduce yourself? No, Ben Wong, East Asian Studies. I, I just had a comment on, on your uh, virtue based legitimacy and the, sort of a virtue exemplary, exemplary sort of a model for sort of leadership. leadership. It, it seems that it's not really a retrieval. You, you, you talk about virtue. It's not a retrieval from, from the uh, antiquity, from uh, Yao, Yao and Shu, an emperor, like right, who served the, the common good, or who didn't go home, or even didn't try to manage the, the flood, right? I mean, passed the home for, 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 for three days, to, uh, three times without going into it because it's the flood out, out there to manage, right? And that was really uh, uh, a, a practice in the uh, revolutionary modernity, revolutionary tradition that uh, I think it worked for, for a while, right? Because you have tons and tons of uh, scholarship and, uh, and, and literature about serving the people. Right? It's, it's the golden rule for the virtual economy, right? Uh, Mao Mao said so, so much about it, and Liu Shaoqi wrote a book about how the cultivation of the commons virtue because it served the people. And, and, and it, 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 uh, still, I, I was wondering why you didn't actually, actually tap into that. Uh, it's that, that is a whole chunk of history uh, that actually, actually has proved that the virt virtue theory, virtue as the political morality for uh, the good, good, good governance, actually the work for a time, and the why this was, was abandoned, was forgotten by, by the current. current. Right. Well, Thank you. So that had to do with the issue of virtue actually having an historical basis in China and part of its practice earlier and what's going on now. How did it get abandoned? What's happening? Chander? Hello. Everyone. Will you introduce yourself? Hi. My name is Chander Chabla. I run a software startup. So very different than 
part of the economic civil society. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for organizing the event. Thanks for your thoughts. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how the governance varies with the size of the population. So arguably, Singapore has the most effective government. And then you look at you know, US, probably 10x more, or a little bit less, and China much more. And then secondly, you have, you know, I would say China has brought up almost half a billion people out of poverty with their system. And with our system, we struggle for eight years or longer to get 40 million healthcare. So how do issues vary with the size of, uh, or not sorry, size, but the government's model? And we had one last question that I'm permitting. Introduce yeah, uh, yourself. Yeah, David Kidd, uh, Cognitive Science and Evolutionary Anthropology at Oxford. Um, building on the, the, the notion of, of, of the licensing and, and, and opportunity, you know, what the state of California already licenses over 50 different occupations. A lot of different departments in government, you have to have different licenses. There's absolutely no reason that the ones at the top echelon where you say the merit uh, occupies that we can't come up with you know, refined and in the building on. But then that means that we would have to, as a people, in our hearts, each of us, to say, is that a good thing or is not? Like, what is the absurdity why we don't do that compared to all the other occupations? And then we would have to say, in California, we have uh, the prop system. Well, right now, the prop system is wholly owned by the, 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 the money. And, and it the prop started. system is proposition oh, for those who are oh. not Californians yeah, yeah, or uh, West uh, Coasters. Yeah. <laughs> you know, public ideas for what needs to change. We need a big change here to allow licensing for something very basic that affects millions of us, right? Well, how are we going to do that when our prop system is bought? And it was started 100 years ago to get away from the big uh, money interest controlling the elections. So I think we're on the right track. If, and if we just kind of zoom in and with optimism, barely on and this is exactly what needs to do next in a big picture. Give people the big picture, and then here's what we here's how we start. <coughs> That's my name. Thank you. Well, this time you go first, because Nicholas has done great work on the California reforming the prop system, so why don't you? Yeah, so that last question was about the, the systems that we're stuck with that are <laughs> bought, even though they may have started very well, <laughs> is representing the people. Nicholas? Um, well, maybe we'll start with that. I mean, I think your first point, I, I think I understood, you're saying in any profession, you put the most competent people at the top. And in government, at least in competitive democracies, not necessarily the most competent. Now, in administrative offices, in theory, yes. But they're controlled, really, by the political side. So again, it's, a, it's very tricky, because the political side sometimes represent the will of the people, but they're not necessarily the most competent people. So. Um, should there be certain standards, and why not? As opposed to uh, Daniel's idea, well, you win an election, then you have to pass an exam. Why not do the other way around? Uh, you have to have certain qualifications, minimum qualifications in terms of uh, competency, having maybe run something, having been responsible for a group of people, meaning have you know, a real uh, demonstrated ability to have taken care of people, and then you can run. Why not? Um, so reverse it. In terms of the uh, proposition system in California, um, we've done a lot of work there. We actually reformed it last year. Uh, and I think, personally, I think you're right. It used to be an instrument of democracy, but today, uh, because it costs so much money to run these things, uh, whoever can fund them uh, will, let's say, have the biggest voice. And the propositions in a state uh, where there are 40 million people, um, uh, Become, very, become a very tricky way of um, um, expressing the will of the people and of governance. Uh, in California, it's doubly bad, because in California, the governor or the legislature, for anything that's really major, like tax reforms, you need two-thirds of both houses. So it's very hard to get. So anything that's major has to go through propositions. And the propositions are let's say, put on the ballot with well 
with, let's say, good intentions. But they are very, very narrow in terms of what, you know, a proposition is about something very specific. You know, something like, we'd all like to have, you know, every street should have, you know, a green tree, you know, every 10 feet. Sounds great, so people will vote for it. But nobody looks at the unintended consequences and looks at other things, other needs of the state. So the issue with the proposition system is that you, you get people to vote for very isolated things. And, um, and that has created sort of havoc for the state in many different ways, in social ways, political ways, and frankly, budget. Uh, and what we did last year, we reformed the proposition um, system somewhat. You can never take it away. You cannot limit money either, unfortunately. This has been now passed constitutionally uh, in the US, uh, at least for now, which I think is terrible. Um, so what we did is we made it more open, more deliberate, uh, more transparent. So more transparent about money. Um, propositions now can be changed. They used to be totally inflexible. You couldn't even withdraw them if you put one in. Uh, but now you can change them. You could look at unintended consequences and the legislature can put up an opposing uh, bill. So we made it, frankly, much more user-friendly, but still not perfect. Um, and frankly, to have a proposition system for such a big place where voters are being gamed and are not always informed, and that's the way to really govern, is frankly, you know, a, so almost like a travesty of democracy. The intention is good, the result is not so good. So that, maybe you answer all the other questions. <laughs> you know, I think I'm going to stop us there because um, I think that was a wonderful bring us back to the United States and some of the problems we have to deal with in our own democracy. Um, I really recommend you follow what the Institute is doing and um, read both of their books and I think you'll see some of the at least discussions of some of these other issues which are clearly ongoing. And do read the New York Times tomorrow, the art section. Um, Nicholas Bergrun wants to bridge the east-west gap, and it's about the creation of the Center for Philosophy and Culture. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.